So the next speaker for this morning is uh, Dr. Supratim Shengupta from Department of Physical Sciences in Aizar, Kolkata. And he'll be talking about games people play, individual <laughs> decisions and collective outcomes. Okay, thank you for the invitation and uh, I'm glad that my talk has been nicely set up by the previous two speakers in terms of introducing the terminology that I'll be using. Uh, so, the evolution of cooperation has been a long-standing yet fascinating problem and uh, for the last six decades or so, a lot of work has been done to try and extract the mechanisms uh, by which uh, cooperation can be uh, can proliferate and be sustained in the population. And this is an interesting problem because cooperation is costly. Uh, so how do we explain the proliferation and sustenance of uh, cooperation uh, in a, within the Darwinian paradigm where uh, survival of the fittest reigns supreme? But in order to understand the evolution of cooperation, we need to understand how individuals change their behavior over time and how these individual behaviors are affected by the number and uh, attributes of the connected neighbors of those indiv individuals, as well as the structure of the social network in which they are embedded. And uh, we would also like to understand how these factors together uh, shape collective outcomes at the level of the population. Uh, so in today's talk, I'm going to focus on uh, two examples of social conflict in human societies, although I should mention that uh, some of the models of evolution of cooperation has been tested through very clever, interesting experiments done by various people, sorry, uh, uh, various groups mentioned here uh, using uh, communities of microbial organisms uh, including bacteria and yeast. But for today's talk, I'm going to focus on uh, two examples of social conflict in human societies. So the first example that I'm going to talk about is something that all of you are familiar with and it has to do with bribery, uh, especially in India. It's something that's, uh, that hits, cuts close to the bone. Uh, and our interest in this work was motivated by an article which came out in the Ministry of Finance website. It was not published in a journal by Koshik Basu, who at that time was the chief economic advisor uh, to the prime minister. And he wrote an article saying why for a class of bribes the act of giving uh, bribes should be legalized. And uh, it generated a lot of controversy because in that paper, the main premise was that for harassment bribes, which are a specific class of bribes, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, he suggested that the act of giving bribes should be legalized. In other words, the person giving a bribe should not be penalized for doing so, whereas the person taking the bribe should be penalized. Whereas the current legal situation demands that both the person giving the bribe as well as the person taking the bribe should be penalized if they are caught uh, in this incident. Now, it generated a lot of controversy and there were opinions from both the left and the right, uh, but surprisingly, when we looked at the literature, we found that there was very little quantitative work to back up this hypothesis. So we wanted to understand whether it is indeed too, uh, true that an asymmetric penal penalty scenario that Basu proposed, where the bribe giver is not penalized, whereas the bribe take, uh, taker is penalized, does induce, uh, does reduce the incidence of harassment bribery. So what do I mean by harassment bribery? These are bribes that are given for services that an, a citizen is legally entitled to. So suppose I want a driver's license, I have to pay money to uh, get the driver's license without maybe giving the driving test. In some cases, uh, if I need a passport, I have to pay money to get the passport in time and so on. So these are the kinds of bribes where the services are, uh, the citizens are legally entitled to the services without paying the additional bribe that is often required. So we built an evolutionary game theory model, uh, and I'll describe the model very briefly. And uh, So you have two officers who uh, follow two different strategies. One does not demand bribe an honest officer, the other is a corrupt officer who demands bribe, and they interact with citizens who are uh, 
uh, asking for that service, and there are three categories of citizens depending on the strategies they adopt. Uh, one pays the bribe silently, I call them apathetic citizens. The second category are conscientious, they pay but they complain if there is a procedure for doing so. And the third refuses to pay the bribe, whom I call honest citizens. So in this model, uh, each of them interact uh, over time, and uh, there's random pairing which takes place as a result of which, uh, depending on the pairing, each of them get a payoff as a result of that interaction. And this is a payoff matrix which determines what sort of payoffs each of the strategies across the different classes get over time, or for each interaction. Now, so this is the cartoon of how the model is, uh, how the model proceeds. So we have uh, the first part, which consists of the interaction. We have random pairings between officers and citizens, and each pairing results in payoffs to each. And uh, as a result, the payoff is calculated for every pair that is generated in the population. Uh, and after the payoffs have been calculated, the strategy update takes place. So, for instance, in this case, uh, a focal player is selected from the population, and a, a role model, which is another player, which is also selected. The two compare their payoff, the focal player, decides to imitate the role model with a probability proportional to the difference in payoffs. Uh, and uh, so if the payoff of the focal player is larger, then it retains the strategy that it had. If the focal player has a lower payoff, it can change and imitate the strategy of the role, play, role model with a probability proportional to this difference. And in this way, uh, the Imitation process proceeds, and over time, uh, you have the population evolving, the strategies change in frequency over time, and eventually you can end up with a population consisting of either only honest officers and a combination of citizens of the different, uh, three different types, which doesn't matter because they're all interacting with honest officers. So, so we... Uh, simulated this model using both replicator dynamics uh, as well as agent-based stochastic simulations. And this is a plot showing the effect of the replicator dynamics. So this, we looked at a large variety of parameters uh, and situations, and this is one such plot from this, which compares the different scenarios of asymmetric and symmetric penalty with and without refund. So you can see that this is the current scenario which exists where there are no refunds allowed, the uh, symmetric liability exists, and there's very little region of parameter space for which honest officers can prevail. So in this case, corruption is endemic in society, uh, and uh, it's mostly dominated by corrupt officers. And uh, there's a correlation between the two, because uh, this is uh, mostly apathetic citizens who pay the bribe without, uh, without complaining. So on the other hand, if you have an asymmetric liability scenario, uh, you can have a situation where uh, depending on the cost of complaining and the bribe amount, uh, there can be regions in parameter space where honest officers can prevail, and uh, this can lead to elimination of corrupt officers from the population. And uh, you can see that there's a strong correlation between the uh, fixation of honest officers and uh, complaining citizens who are either conscientious or those who refuse to pay which, uh, especially in the regime of large bribe amount. So this seems to suggest that uh, Basu's proposal of asymmetric penalty does indeed make a difference in reducing the number of incidents of harassment bribery. But is this really true for uh, other situations where the strategy update occurs in a slightly different way? So mm, we wanted to test this hypothesis, and we uh, 
you know, took recourse to the work which was done many years ago by Helbing, who proposed another strategy update model, which is called the alternative strategy update model, where uh, the focal player does not imitate the role model with a probability proportional to the difference in payoff, but instead he looks at the payoff that he receives when he interacts with the role model, and then decides whether he's winning or losing, depending on the payoff that he would re have received if he had used an alternative strategy. And if he finds that an alternative strategy would have led to him getting a larger payoff, he decides to switch to that alternative strategy with the probability proportional to the difference in payoff between the alternative strategy and the original strategy. And this is a slightly different model, but in this model we find that uh, there's very little uh, effect of the asymmetric penalty scenario, even with refunds, compared to the case of a strategy update which occurs through uh, a probability proportional to the difference in payoff, which is the standard game theoretic uh, way of uh, doing strategy updates. Right? So it seems that the prevalence of bribery is indeed affected by how individuals update their strategies over time, and uh, this would uh, suggest that one should be careful in formulating new policies when it comes to eradicating or at least uh, reducing the incidence of harassment bribery. So this was the initial work done with a mixed population. There was no underlying population structure, so we wanted to understand what effect the population structure has on the prevalence of uh, harassment, bribery, uh, and corruption in the population. So we did two analysis which uh, uses two different kinds of networks in which the citizens are embedded. So first is a simpler analysis which uh, embeds the citizens in a regular network while varying the number of connections between the citizens. So you have uh, what's called an interdependent network, where you have this row of officers who are interacting with citizens through, uh, through an interaction network. Uh, in this case, it's just one-to-one -one interaction. But uh, the citizens are also interacting with each other, not directly, but in terms of deciding whether to change their strategy or not through another citizen interaction network and so the citizens decide each citizen decides whether to update his strategy or not depending on the influence of his connected neighbors and in this uh, model we find uh, an interesting result where the uh, degree of the network affects the uh, number of incidents of harassment bribery in the population and uh, the y-axis here plots the region of parameter space where honest officers can prevail. Uh, this is the fraction of region of parameter space where honest officers can prevail and this seems to increase. So there seems to be an optimal degree of the citizen network which uh, allows for a larger uh, likelihood of honest officers to prevail. And you can see this uh, from the simulations of the agent-based models with various degrees of the citizen network and uh, you know, for very small uh, citizen network degree you have, uh, this is one realization, one uh, you have uh, corrupt officers prevailing and getting fixed in the population over time but uh, as the degree changes over time it uh, sort of changes, the dynamics changes, but again uh, comes back to a state where the corrupt officers prevail for a higher degree. And uh, then we looked at more realistic network structures where uh, you don't just have citizens uh, connected through each other, uh, to each other on regular networks, but also random and small world networks. So P here corresponds to the uh, probability of rewiring the network which decides uh, how you can interpolate between a completely regular network and a completely nat uh, a random network through a, a small world type of network. So p equal to 0 0.1 corresponds to a small world network. And we found that uh, depending on network structure, uh, the population level outcomes can change quite a lot across the parameter space that we have examined. And here we find that uh, the fraction of parameter space over which honest officers can prevail uh, changes significantly, but it also depends on the 
asymmetry in the population sizes between the officers and the citizens. So in the simplistic model, we had uh, citizens and officers having the same size, but that's not how it happens in reality, because uh, officers are usually smaller in number, a large number of citizens interact with a small set of officers. So when you increase the size of the citizen network relative to the size of the officer network, it becomes progressively more difficult to uh, ensure that honest officers will prevail, and this is seen uh, in this case. But uh, the trend depends on uh, the nature of the network, right? So you can see that for a, a large asymmetry in population sizes, a regular network has a, a large, a smaller region of parameter space over which honest officers can prevail. Whereas if you go towards a random network char characterized by a value of p equal to one, then it is more likely for honest officers to prevail. So. This, in general, suggests that uh, how individuals change their behavior over time and how those behaviors are affected by their connected neighbors as well as the underlying structure of the population does play a role in determining how the, uh, whether corruption can uh, you know, prevail or whether honest officers can take over uh, in such situations involving harassment bribery. So can I take two more minutes to finish? So, so the, there's another part of uh, the work that I wanted to talk about, which uh, is along similar lines, but uh, in that we wanted to explore how uh, changes in individual behavior are affected by the local environment. So one of the uh, you know, characteristics of evolutionary game theory models uh, is how the strategy update takes place. And this is typically done by means of a pairwise comparison. So you, uh, in a network, you pick one node as a focal player, and another connected neighbor is randomly selected from that uh, focal player's neighborhood. And then the payoffs of the two are compared. And so this is called a pairwise comparison method, and this is usually how strategy updates take place, where this determines the probability that uh, individual X changes over to the strategy followed by Y. Okay. So this has uh, no role for the local environment in which the players are embedded, how, uh, how many cooperators are there in his local a neighborhood of the focal player and so on. So we wanted to develop a model where this local environmental effect is taken into account. And in this, uh, we use the rule that the probability with which an individual cooperates depends not only on the local environment, the fraction of cooperators that are present in his local neighborhood, but also on the wealth difference between uh, the focal player and the average wealth of the neighborhood. And so we find that, uh, and this was a dynamic network, so th there were two processes going on. One was strategy update, and the other was uh, network rewiring. So uh, two pairs of individuals were allowed to change their, uh, uh, to rewire the network, break connections, and make new links in addition to updating their strategies. Right? And uh, the reason we find this interesting is because we were able to use, uh, reproduce the results of uh, a behavioral experiment uh, that was done recently, some years ago, uh, by uh, Chris Takis' group in, in Yale, where uh, they looked at these dynamic networks and they found that the wealth distribution, uh, the, which is characterized by the Gini coefficient, follows a certain pattern. And uh, using this uh, model of uh, strategy update in a dynamical network, which takes into account the local environment and the relative wealth, so we were able to uh, reproduce this model uh, in fairly uh, quantitative detail. You can see the, by comparing the solid lines in these two figures that even at the level of uh, Gini coefficient, they match fairly well. Okay, so I'll end here with some general conclusions. So we see that changes in individual behavior 
can and do shape collective outcomes during social conflict. And the local environment, as well as the underlying structure of the population, uh, plays an important role in determining the outcome of the conflict at the level of the population. And I'll leave with some questions as food for thought, which can hopefully be discussed in more detail during the discussion se sessions. So can we uncover general rules underlying evolution of decisions under different scenarios? Uh, these rules will obviously not be universal. Uh, they have to be tailored to specific situations, uh, but still can we formulate rules by which people change their decisions over time? Because this has implications for social learning in structured populations, and perhaps insights can be obtained from symmetric and asymmetric evolutionary games on such networks. Thank you.